Welcome back to Learning as a Hobby. Um, today, I'm going to start my playlist on uh, linear algebra. Um, my wife is watching uh, some TV in the background, so if there is a little bit of noise in the background, I do apologize for that, but um, I'll do the best that I can. Uh, so for linear algebra, let me start by um, the book that I'm, I'm going to pick. Uh, actually, even before that, let me show you some, some of the books that I was considering. So I was considering uh, using this book, which is very famous, uh, Linear Algebra Done Right by Sheldon Axler. Uh, has a very uh, provocative title. Um, I went, when I was in college, uh, I my uh, first linear algebra professor uh, chose an earlier edition of this book uh, for the class. So I, I've actually gone through a earlier version of this book years ago. Um, I think it was like the first or second edition. I, I don't actually remember, but I wanted to go through this uh, this newer edition because he's added some things. And it's also a very interesting linear algebra book because its uh, method is uh, different than most linear algebra books than, that uh, are popular. So that was one I was considering. Uh, another one was I was considering, which is also a very famous uh, linear algebra book is this one, Linear Algebra. Uh, fourth edition by uh, Friedberg, Incel, and Spence. Um, this is uh, another book that's at the, the same level as uh, Linear Algebra Done Right. It's a proof-oriented linear algebra course, just like Linear Algebra Done Right. But uh, this one focuses, focuses on the more standard uh, method of uh, instruction for linear algebra. Uh, it's a very good book as well. Um, I've tutored uh, classes that have used this this book before. So um, there's uh, some interesting problems in here and everything. Um, another interesting book, uh, actually, before I get to this one, uh, another famous linear algebra book is the one by Gilbert Strang, Introduction to Linear Algebra. And again, this is a fantastic uh, introduction to uh, linear algebra. Um, it's uh, more applications oriented. So there's a lot of fun applications, uh, exercises and examples in, in this book. Um, he also has um, a set of lecture videos that he uh, has posted uh, to MIT Open Courseware for free that you can watch uh, based off of the this book. So he, you know, his lectures follow this, this book that he wrote. So that was another one I was considering. Um, and then lastly, uh, there's another good book that doesn't really seem to get um, the uh, the credit that it should have, I think. And this that's this one here, uh, Linear Algebra and um, an Introductory Approach by Charles Curtis. Uh, this one is, is more similar, I think, to Strang's book rather than the other two that I uh, talked about. Um, it's very well written. Uh, the exercises are good. Um, and uh, it's, a, again, a more standard sort of, you know, linear algebra and introductory book uh, taught in, you know, in the more standard way. But um, since I'm making videos about this, I had to choose the controver the more <laughs> controversial one. So I'm going to go with linear algebra done right. That's the one that uh, I'm going to go through for linear algebra here. Um, so let me uh, talk a little bit about this one. All right, so this is written by Sheldon Axler. Uh, this is the third edition, which I, be I believe is the newest edition of the book. Um, there is no solution manual for this, but uh, you know, you'll know you find that that's usually the case for uh, once you get to a certain uh, level in math that uh, there are no more solutions. Uh, so you have to you know just make sure that you're doing everything correctly. Um, because you can't, if, especially if you're doing self-study, because you can't check whether <laughs> you're doing it correctly or not. But um, all right, I, so I want to uh, read through the the, uh, auth the author's preface here just to explain the title and uh, you know the the method of instruction that this book is going to use. Then I'll go over um, uh, chapter one, part A. Uh, I'll go over the summary for that, and then in the next video, I'll do the some of the problems for, for Section 1A. So let me start with the preface. So here's uh, Sheldon Axler's uh, preface. Oh, I should say also, I, I almost forgot, there are um, video lectures uh, by Sheldon Axler for this book as well, uh, which is another reason why I wanted to choose that. It's, you know, I was like, should I choose 
um, Strang because he has lectures. Should I choose Axler because he has lectures? And I went with this one just because I think it's the it'll make for more interesting videos. So um, I'll post the the link in the description box down below to Sheldon Axler's um, lecture videos for this uh, for this book. They're um, available for free to watch on YouTube. So all right. So let me read his start by reading his preface. You're about to teach a course that will probably give students their second exposure to linear algebra. During their first brush with the subject, your students probably worked with Euclidean spaces and matrices. In contrast, this course will emphasize abstract vector spaces and linear maps. So again, that's another reason why I wanted to choose uh, this book. It's a more abstract approach. And we will be going through a, a kind of like linear algebra course through Schifrin, but that again, that's sort of like the uh, type of course that he's talking about as like a first introduction where it's this would be your like second course in linear algebra I guess so it's it's taught from a more mathematically mature level um okay continuing the audacious title of this book deserves an explanation Almost all linear algebra books use determinants to prove that every linear operator on a finite dimensional complex vector space has an eigenvalue. Determinants are difficult, non-intuitive, and often defined without motivation. To prove the theorem about existence of eigenvalues on complex vector spaces, most books must define determinants, prove that a linear map is not invertible if and only if its determinant equals zero, and then define the characteristic polynomial. This torturous, uh, torturous, tortuous, or, and then he has in parentheses, torturous path gives students little feeling for why eigenvalues exist. In contrast, the simple determinant free proofs presented here, for example, C521, offer more insights. Once determinants have been banished to the end of the book, a new route opens to the main goal of linear algebra, understanding the structure of linear operators. This book starts at the beginning of the subject with no prerequisites other than the usual demand for suitable mathematical maturity. Even if your students have already seen some of the material in the first few chapters, and you'll see when we get to section 1A, actually, it's going to be a review of some of uh, the stuff that we've actually already done in so far in Schifrin. So there'll be some overlap there. Uh, where was I? Um, even if your students have already seen some of the material in the first few chapters, they may be unaccustomed to working exercises of the type presented here, most of which require an underlying, uh, sorry, most of which require an understanding of proofs. Here's a chapter by chapter summary of the highlights of the book. Chapter one uh, is vector spaces are defined in this chapter and their basic properties are developed. Chapter two, linear independence, span, basis, and dimension are defined in this chapter, which presents the basic theory of finite dimensional vector spaces. Chapter three, linear maps are introduced in this chapter. The key results here is the fundamental theorem of linear maps. Uh, if T is a linear map then v on V, then dimension V equals dimension null T plus dimension range T. That's the fundamental theorem of linear maps. Quotient spaces and duality are topics in this chapter at a higher level of abstraction than other parts of the book. These topics can be skipped without running into problems elsewhere in the book. Uh, I, I actually do want to go through those because uh, we're not going to look at th that type of thing in Schifrin, I have the feeling. so. Uh, chapter four, the part of the theory of polynomials that will be needed to understand linear operators is presented in this chapter. This chapter contains no linear algebra. It can be covered quickly, especially if your students are already familiar with these results. Uh, I will be going through that chapter because um, on this channel, I haven't done anything, you know, I haven't made a series of videos on like pre-calculus or, any, or anything like that. So uh, I think it, uh, for someone who's watching this, the results on about polynomials in that chapter might be useful to see if you haven't taken pre-calculus or if you are currently taking pre-calculus uh, or if you've took it, taken it a long time ago and maybe have forgotten all of that stuff. So we'll go through that chapter uh, in this playlist. Uh, chapter five, the idea of studying a linear operator by restricting it to small subspaces leads to eigenvectors in the early part of the chapter. The highlight of this chapter is a simple proof that on complex vector spaces, eigenvalues always exist. 
This result is then used to show that each linear operator on a complex vector space has an upper triangular matrix with respect to some basis. All this is done without defi uh, defining determinants or characteristic polynomials. Sorry, let me just just hear my leg is falling asleep. All right, chapter six is, uh, is chapter six, inner products sorry, inner product spaces are defined in this chapter and their basic properties are developed along with standard tools such as orthonormal bases and the Gram-Schmidt procedure. This chapter also shows how orthogonal projections can be used to solve certain minimization problems. Chapter seven, the spectral theorem, which characterizes the linear operators for which there exists an orthonormal basis consisting of eigenvectors uh, is the highlight of this chapter. The work in earlier chapters pays off here with especially simple proofs. This chapter also deals with positive operators, isometries, the polar decomposition, and the SVD, or simple singular value decomposition. Uh, chapter eight, minimal polynomials, characteristic polynomials, and generalized eigenvectors are introduced in this chapter. The main achievement of this chapter is the description of a linear operator on a complex vector space in terms of its generalized eigenvectors. This description enables one to prove many of the results usually proved using Jordan form. Sorry, this, this uh, futon is not very comfortable to sit on. Um, where was I? For example, these tools, tools are used to prove that every invertible linear operator on a complex vector space has a square root. The chapter concludes with a proof that every linear operator on a complex vector space can be put into Jordan form. Chapter nine, linear operators on a vector, real vector space uh, occupy center stage in this chapter. Here, the main technique is complexification, which is a natural extension of an operator on a real vector space to an operator on a complex vector space. Complexification allows our results about complex vector spaces to be transferred easily to real vector spaces. Um, for example, this technique is used to show that every linear operator on a real vector space has an invariant subspace of dimension one or two. At, uh, dimension one or two. As another example, we show that every linear operator on an odd dimensional real vector space has an eigenvalue. Um, chapter 10, the trace and determinant on complex vector spaces are defined in this chapter as the sum of the eigen values and the product of the eigenvalues, both counting multiplicity. These easy to remember definitions would not be possible with the traditional approach to eigenvalues because the traditional method uses determinants to prove that sufficient eigenvalues exist. The standard theorems about determinants now become much clearer. The polar decomposition and the real spectral theorem are used to derive the change of variables formula for multivariable integrals in a fashion that makes the appearance of the determinant there seem natural. This book usually develops linear algebra simultaneously for real and complex vector spaces by letting uh, boldface f denote either the real or complex numbers. If you and your students prefer to think of f, <laughs> excuse me, as an arbitrary field, then see the comments at the end of section 1.1a. Uh, uh, I prefer avoiding arbitrary fields at this level because they introduce extra abstraction without leading to any new linear algebra. Also, students are more comfortable thinking of polynomials as functions instead of the more formal objects needed for polynomials with coefficients in finite fields. Finally, even if the beginning part of the theory were developed with arbitrary fields, inner product spaces would push consideration back to just real and complex vector spaces. You probably cannot cover everything in this book in one semester. Going through the first eight chapters is a good goal for one a one semester course. If you must reach chapter 10, then consider covering chapters four and nine in 15 minutes each, as well as skipping the material on quotient spaces and duality in chapter three. A goal more important than teaching any particular theorem is to develop in the students the ability to understand and manipulate the objects of linear algebra. Mathematics can be learned only by doing. Fortunately, linear algebra has many good homework exercises. When teaching this course during each class, I usually assign as homework several of the exercises do the next class. Going over the homework might take up a third or even half of a typical class. Uh, or this is not really a typical class situation, so, you know, we'll, we're going to do it the way that I've been doing it.
uh, major changes from previous editions. So uh, like I said, I, I actually uh, went through a, a previous edition of this book when I was an undergraduate. So uh, let me, let's see what's changed since the last one. Uh, this edition contains 561 exercises, including 337 new exercises that were not in previous editions. So that's a good thing. Uh, exercises now appear at the end of each section rather than at the end of each chapter. Uh, that's just formatting thing. Uh, that's okay. Many new examples have been added to illustrate the key ideas of linear algebra. Beautiful new formatting, including the use of color, creates pages with an unusually pleasant appearance in both print and electronic versions as a visual aid. Definitions are in beige boxes and theorems are in blue boxes in the color version of the book. Each theorem now has a descriptive name. New topics covered in the book include product spaces, quotient spaces, and duality. Chapter 9, Operators on a unreal vector spaces has been completely rewritten to take advantage of simplifications via complex complexification. This approach allows for more streamlined presentations in chapter five and seven, because those chapters now focus mostly on complex vector spaces. Hundreds of improvements have been made throughout the book. For example, the proof of Jordan form section 8D has been simplified. Uh, and then he has a, a link, a, a, um, um, a web address for it. Uh, for his um, um, website about the book, uh, maybe I'll put that in the uh, in the description box down description box down below as well if you want to check it out. All right, so that's the the preface for the teacher. There's a short preface for the student too, so let me just read that and then we'll get to the the section one a. Uh, preface to the student. You're probably about to learn, begin your second exposure to linear algebra. Unlike your first brush with the subject, which probably emphasized Euclidean spaces and matrices, this encounter will focus on abstract vector spaces and linear maps. These terms will be defined later, so don't worry if you do not know what they mean. This book starts from the beginning of the subject, assuming no knowledge of linear algebra. The key point is that you are about to immerse yourself in serious mathematics with an emphasis on attaining a deep understanding of the definitions, theorems, and proofs. You cannot read mathematics the way you read a novel. If you zip through a page in less than an hour, you're probably going too fast. When you encounter the phrase, as you should verify, you should indeed do the verification, which will usually re require some writing on your part. When steps are left out, you need to supply the missing pieces. You should ponder and internalize each definition. For each theorem, you should seek examples to show why each hypothesis is necessary. Discussions with other students should help. As a visual aid, definitions are in beige boxes and theorems are in blue boxes. Uh, each theorem has a descriptive name. Please check the website below. Uh, same same thing I just ended with. Uh, best wishes for success and enjoyment in learning learning linear algebra. Sheldon Axler. Okay, so this is the book we're going to be going through. Um, it, it it's deceptively um, small in size. Uh, this book is um, uh, quite formidable uh, in uh, its problems. It's it's pretty famous for you know. Uh, being a, a very rigorous and um, uh, if you like mathematics, it's also fun. Uh, the exercises can be very difficult, though. So we'll we'll start on let's start on chapter one uh, a part one a. Uh, I have my summary written up already, so I'll, I'll go through that with you guys, and then uh, after this, I'll make a video on the exercises that I did for for section one a. All right. So let me start by bringing up the lecture notes or the sorry the summary rather. Uh, oops, these are the exercises. Let me, here we go, notes. Okay, so um, as usual, my summary here is just a skeleton of what he talks about in the book. So um, just as usual, you should take the time to read the actual book uh, yourself because, you know, you'll be missing out on a lot of details and stuff if you just rely on uh, the summary that I'm giving you here. Um, and I didn't do all of the exercises to section 1A. Uh, the reason for that is because the majority of the exercises uh, for this section are just verifying that, for example, the complex numbers or um, uh, n tuples of entries from a field satisfy uh, field axioms or vector space axioms. Uh, and we've done that already a few times. And uh, honestly, it's just tedious and I don't want to 
honestly, I just don't feel like doing that, <laughs> spending the time to go over that again. So uh, I'm going to skip those and I'm just going to do the, the, all the exercises that don't have to, don't deal with verifying that certain sets uh, satisfy certain axioms. Uh, because like I said, w there's no point in repeating that. I've done that already in um, Spivak and also in, uh, in um, Schifrin. So, okay. So let's start with uh, the first sentence of the book is telling you what um, linear, al what linear algebra is. So here, uh, linear algebra is the study of linear maps on finite dimensional vector spaces. All right, so those are the, going to be the main um, things we're going to be focusing on in this course. We're going to be focusing on linear maps. So we'll define that later on. And we're going to be focusing on finite dimensional vector spaces rather than infinite dimensional vector spaces, even though there are some examples in the book of infinite dimensional vector spaces. So that's what a course in linear algebra is about. All right, so he starts with a definition of the complex numbers uh, because we're going to um, use the complex numbers and also the real numbers to stand in uh, for what we mean by a field. So, you know, he, he does, he um, explains everything in terms of an arbitrary field. And he does mention it in the, the thing that I just read that you can, if you assume that, um, uh, the entries come and the scalar multiplication comes from an arbitrary field, everything works out just fine with the exception of a few things. Um, if, if your field has a uh, characteristic, not zero. Um, so we're not really going to deal with that uh, in this book. We'll, we'll just assume that F stands for either the complex numbers or uh, the real numbers. Okay, so a complex number is an ordered pair, A, B, where A, B are real numbers, but we, uh, as usual, you know, this is the way people usually write complex numbers as A plus I, B, I stands for the imaginary unit. So the set of complex numbers, which we denote by um, this fancy C, so, and if you remember, we use this symbol for the set of real numbers. So that fancy C stands for the set of all complex numbers, which is everything of the form A plus IB, where A and B are real numbers, and I stands for the imaginary unit. Okay, and uh, this is how you add complex numbers together. You add the real parts together, and you add the, the imaginary parts together, and that gives you a new complex number. And multiplication is defined in a slightly more um, complicated way. Uh, you don't have to memorize these formulas if you just remember uh, addition is uh, like simplifying um, an algebraic expression, meaning you just combine like terms and uh, multiplication is kind of like uh, using the distributive law, like when you're multiplying binomials out uh, and remembering that I squared is minus one, right? That's the definition of the imaginary unit. Right. And then he asks you to verify uh, using the definition of multiplication on C. He asks the reader to verify that I squared is minus one. So I just did that down here. So I squared using the, the definition of multiplication is given by this product. And using the definition that's equal to this and notice you get minus one. Okay. So that's the verification. He does give a, a bunch of examples in the text as well. Like for example, he says, evaluate this. Maybe I'll do this one, but uh, most of the examples I'm just gonna skip over and just go over the theorems and the definitions and we'll do some you know, actual calculations and stuff in the homework uh, or in the exercises rather. So if you want, let me just show you, uh, I'll do this one example here. Uh, if you wanna multiply these two complex numbers out, again, you use the distributive law. So you take this times this, plus this times this, plus this times th this, uh, whoops, sorry, uh, first, whoops, I forgot outer. So this times this, um, you know, it's like, if you remember, you know, when you're multiplying binomials, right, FOIL. Um, so let's do that here. So we get two times four is eight. Um, two times five I is 10 I. Three times four, three I times four is 12 I. And uh, 3i times 5i is 15i squared, oops, plus 15i squared. And remember that i squared is minus, defined to be minus 1, so this is 8 plus 10i and 12i is 22i minus 15. Okay, and 8 minus 15 is minus 7 
plus 22i, and that's the product of those two complex numbers. Okay, um, so that's just a, an example he has in the book. And like I said, most of the examples in the that he does in the book, I'm going to skip over um, and just focus on definitions and theorems. But um, properties of complex numbers, uh, I won't I won't really go over this in detail because we've are actually already seen these uh, properties in uh, Spivak. These are the field axioms. So uh, all he's saying is that the complex numbers are a field, right? Um, then he asks uh, to show that alpha beta equals beta alpha for all uh, complex numbers. Uh, I don't know why I wrote lambda here. Uh, it's just two complex numbers. Again, I'm going to skip that just because it's a verification. And I, I, honestly, I just don't feel like doing another, another one of those. Um, so I'll skip that definition. Um, uh, here he's defining uh, what we mean by division and, and subtraction. Um, of complex numbers. So let negative alpha denote the additive inverse of alpha. Thus negative alpha is the unique complex number such that alpha plus minus alpha is zero. That's the, you know, that's the definition uh, of com the uh, additive inverse. Uh, and we, because of that, we define subtraction on C to be, so beta minus alpha is the same thing as beta plus the, the uh, additive inverse of alpha. And we do a similar thing for division. So for alpha not zero, let one over alpha denote the multiplicative inverse of alpha. Thus one over alpha is the unique complex number such that alpha times one over alpha is one, which is uh, one is the uh, multiplicative identity, if you remember. All right, so with that, we define uh, division on the complex numbers to be defined by, um, so beta over divided by alpha is the same thing as beta times one over alpha, which is the multiplicative inverse of alpha. Okay, um, and then here just a, a note uh, throughout the book, uh, he says let uh, f denote either the real numbers or the complex numbers. So the uh, underlying field uh, in the vector spaces that we're going to be looking at here will always be understood to be either be our, the real numbers or the complex numbers, and because of that, we'll use this. Um, generic F to denote that it works for any field and any underlying field. Uh, like I said, there are a little bit of um, some complications that come up if the field is finite. Uh, in other words, if it has a characteristic not zero, but we'll just, we'll, we won't do that here. We'll just assume that it's just the real numbers of the complex numbers this way. We don't have to deal with that extra complication. Okay, uh, he does define, uh, make a definition here that you, you don't usually see it in uh, other linear algebra books, but let me just so that we're used to how he does things in the book. Uh, let's read this out. So if n is a um, non-negative integer, uh, a list of length n is an ordered n-tuple. So in other words, it's uh, x1 through xn, where the xj's come from uh, your underlying field. Um, Two lists are equal if they have the same length with the same components in the same order. So again, this is an ordered n-tuple. The order that you write the entries in matters. Uh, the number of entries matter. Um, and for equality, you need uh, the two lists to have the same length and same order along with the same entries. Um, notice that uh, in order for it to be a list, it has to be uh, it has to have a finite number of things in it. So it can't. Uh, he defines actually down here in a note that lists have to. Uh, in order for it to be a list, it has to have finite length. Hence, like an infinite sequence, for example, would not be considered a list in this book. Uh, and also, you have the empty list, which is just parentheses with nothing inside, right? And you need that just for technical reasons. Uh, Here's another important difference between lists and sets. So in lists, repetition and order matters, whereas sets in sets, they don't. Let me just give an example. So for example, a list that looks like this is different from a list that looks like that. Notice this has four things in it, right? You have one repeated twice. This does not have a repeated one. So these are not equal to each other. For sets, that doesn't, that's not true. For a set, if you have repeats, you don't count them as repeats. Right. 
right? So the set containing one, one, two, negative three is the same as the set containing one, two, three. Also in sets, the order that you write the entries in doesn't matter, but it does for lists, right? So there's some important differences between lists and sets. Uh, lists have more structure to them. All right. Here's, he's defining Fn. So again, this this stands for either Rn or Cn, meaning that an, it's an, an, an ordered n, the set of all ordered n tuples of either real numbers or complex numbers. It could be either one. Um, Xj stands for the jth coordinate of the n tuple. Okay, uh, to, def, uh, to add um, vectors in Fn, you add component wise. Right, and then there's a he has a proposition here. Uh, addition in uh, Fn is uh, commutative. Uh, again, I won't prove that just because it's just another verification of an, an uh, of an axiom. Um, and I've actually already done that exact one in in uh, Schifrin, so I'm, I'm just going to skip that. Um, okay, the zero. Um, we denote zero. Uh, sorry, we let zero denote the the list of length n whose coordinates are all zero. All right, so in other words, uh, that's the zero vector. So if you have an n tuple of all zeros, it's the zero vector. It acts like, it acts like the additive identity in Fn. All right, then he goes over some geometric interpretations of vectors in Rn. Um, I've already done that in the video on Schifrin, so I'm gonna skip uh, talking about that again. So if you're if you are not familiar with that, you can watch the video on uh, Schifrin's uh, section one. I think one point one one point two. I think that was the video where we talked about that. Okay, definition for x and f n. The additive inverse x denoted by negative x is the vector uh, negative x in f n such that when you add them together, you get the zero vector. Again, nothing really new. It's just defining that for uh, this set Fn, right? Um, it, so if you, in terms of the coordinates, if x has coordinates x1 through xn, negative x has coordinates negative x1 to negative xn, right? And then you define scalar multiplication here. The product of a number lambda and a vector in Fn is computed by, uh, so if you take lambda times the n-tuple, then you just that you just uh, multiply all of the entries by lambda. Right? That's called scalar multiplication. All right. So of this section is basically, um, with the exception of a couple things like the definition of a list and stuff like that, uh, we've actually already done all of this stuff in Schifrin. So uh, and also we didn't really do it in Schifrin with complex numbers. We did it with real numbers, but uh, it's just that one little extension. Um, so that's ch uh, section one A. Uh, I think one B is on subspaces, and actually section. The next chapter in shift, the next part of the chapter one in Schiffer, I think, is also on subspaces. So we might be doing those at the same time. Um, so like I said, uh, there's going to be some overlap between these two books because they're, you know, Schiffer does give a sort of like a, you know, some introductory stuff about linear algebra in his book, uh, whereas. Um, Linear algebra done right, done right is is solely about linear algebra, and it's done from more a more abstract point of view. All right, so that's section one a. I'm going to end the video here, and then um, I'm going to do the the video on the exercises next. So I'll see you guys in that next video.